screen and we also say some a few words on the the book itself to start off with okay so so i will start today so good morning everyone welcome to the first presentation of the day about a review of the book entitled Installing Automobility, Emerging Politics of Mobility and Streets in Indian Cities, written by Govind Gopakumar this year. We are the working group number one, as follows Ezra, Lucas and me, Agnieszka. And we would like to present today our review, which covers the first, the second, the sixth and the seventh chapter of this book. First of all, I'm going to introduce the book and give a short historical overview that was the main focus of the second chapter. After that, Lucas will review some interesting aspects and Ezra will conclude the presentation comparing the Bengaluru congestion situation with another city. Gobakumar in his book explains the complex constellation of congestion in Bengaluru in southern India that is one of the world's most congested city. The author analyzes the phenomenon of automobility related, relating it to the history of the city and respecting the local context of spatial, technological and social interventions. The book is framed by an introduction and conclusion uh, chapters Chapter two is a historical background of today's congestion situation in Bengaluru. Chapters three and four define the automobile characteristics and introduce the reader to the infrastructure scape. Chapter four discusses how automotive citizenship gets shaped and chapter six gives voice to contrasting concepts that constantly challenge the constellation of congestion and thus offers guidance for alternative paths. So let's start with the historical overview of the layers of congestion in Bengaluru. Um, research in this direction began at the end of the 18th century, uh, where the almost 100 years long period was called disorderly congestion, which means the transformation from a town to a city under colonial governance. It was the time when the Pate, an area of Bangalore city with road laid out in the cardinal directions, reorganized attempts, adding, for example, new office buildings. The next uh, layer of congestion was the unhealthy congestion from 1881 to 1949. This period was focusing on health issues in, in the dense Bengaluru and also science and technology became important and economic status has changed definitely for the better. However, the deteriorating infrastructure of the city led to the bubonic plaque between 1898 and 1899. The third layer was the unpla unplanned congestion from 1949 and 1991. In this period, the number of businesses was growing, which has actually caused an increased number of low and middle class workers. And this stressed the persisting infrastructure of the city. And the final uh, layer of congestion is the flow congestion from 1999 until now. So the number of, business, of businesses is still growing, increasing the number of workers and the economic situation of middle class workers has improved. And additionally, the city became a hub for IT enterprises, highlighting the Silicon Valley of India. And also industrialization goes hand in hand with an increased number of private vehicles in the city. So for the present day, the city needs to act quickly, efficiently to improve the mobility and come up with technological solutions and individual purposes. And here are two images from the new development areas in Bengaluru from 2011 and 2019, I, I guess. 
showing the Bengaluru as it um, as IT enterprises hub. Okay, thank you, uh, Aga, for the overview. And I'll continue with our uh, thoughts on the book. And first of all, we discussed that we really appreciate the book and we really liked um, Gopa Kumar's approach as uh, it shows how deeply embedded historical um, perceptions, local interpretations, and their solutions are in the material environment and that this shapes to a certain degree uh, how we know and experience congestion today. Um, so in this sense, these uh, four phases in our view showed quite uh, interesting how uh, such a discourse on congestion can shift throughout time. And um, yeah, so apart from that, we really liked it. We had to uh, come up with some, some points and we tried to be a bit picky about it. So uh, we've got uh, four minor remarks on our chapter in the whole book. And the first one um, we would describe maybe as a certain certain lack of clarity where the author does um, not go too much into detail how he delineates these, these four periods that I've just outlined. And this is particularly interesting as he refers to other uh, forms of periodization, for instance, along modernization or globalization, but he does not really uh, relate to them. And also he draws very, very clear boundaries, as you've seen um, between years even, and this maybe points or draws, draws a, some kind of a very uh, static images between these periods, which are obviously much more interlinked and um, well, yeah, fluent into another. So the second impression we had was that some of these periods uh, or their, their description sounded quite familiar to us from other local contexts. And yeah, not to say that they're similar, but um, we had the impression that these discourses did appear also in other cities. And for instance, um, uh, the, the example of the unhealthy congestion in the uh, 19th century, and the second period reminded us very much on the uh, 19th century um, urbanism in Europe, which was also to a certain degree um, centered around discourses on hygiene. And uh, the author cites very briefly uh, this work by the uh, political ecologist Matthew Gandhi uh, on the bacteriological city, which um, does focus on yeah, urban city development um, in, in with respect to this um, hygiene discourse. And a very famous example in Europe is, I think, the so-called housemanization of Paris, which was the redevelopment in the 19th century, where uh, the, the famous city planner, Baron Haussmann, um, reshaped the, the previous medieval city grid to a, or not grid, to a very rigid grid with broad streets and um, yeah, very, very distant housing blocks um, and laid out new sewage systems. And this can also, in a part, be seen as reaction to this uh, discourse on, on hygiene and, and certain ways of congestion in the 19th century in Europe. And uh, obviously, this has <clears throat> definitely led to different urban forms. But I think it would have been interesting to see how maybe some some of these ideas and policies travel, um, especially with regard to colonial power relations there. So our third idea uh, was a rather pragmatic question of how these historical measures that were laid out, um, how effective these were basically, and maybe for instance, uh, how measures of de-densification or the installation of sewage system has then back then improved uh, health and overall mortality rates for instance just to see how effective these were in a way. And lastly, we had the impression that uh, throughout the book, the role of the middle class is a little uh, underexposed um, because they are particularly nowadays, I think uh, a very, very important uh, part of the population shaping mobility in Bengaluru. And the, it would have been interesting to see how their thoughts and their perceptions of congestion really shape uh, the practices. Okay, so now Ezra continues with a comparable, some way comparable example that also um, maybe connects to our second discussion point here. You've got one minute left. Oh, sorry. 
So yes, just, just to wrap up what we have uh, said so far, maybe uh, this was not also part of the review paper that we have written, but this is just a reflection that we had from uh, the review of the book and seeing what uh, the historical background that, he's, that he said was. I was struck really by the similarities between uh, the situation in Bangalore City and the situation in my hometown in Cairo. So you can see here uh, Bangalore City on the left with an inner ring road in blue and they're planning a new outer ring road uh, that is in black and red. And uh, on, the, uh, on the image on the right is my home city, uh, Cairo, with also an inner ring road that is in black and an outer ring road that is much, much on a much wider scale and how this is affecting uh, the urban planning in both cities. Um, this is just a reflection and then we go to the conclusion and we, we just conclude that the book has a very good overview of the historical background and gives a really good insight about uh, how what led to the current situation and we recommend that it just got cited also in the handbook of urban mobilities which was also published this year in 2020. Thank you very much. That's all we will now open for discussion. <laughs> Time management. <laughs> that was a good job, Ezra. Um, and we'll open for discussion now, and we hope to hear from the people who submitted peer reviews for this uh, group. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. When I was writing the review, I couldn't force myself not to think about the problem of periodization as colonialism or colonization is one of my favorite fields in geography. Uh, I was thinking that Govind Gopakumar probably expects the reader to, to know something, some background the historical background of India as uh, there were moments, where, there were more moments when I was thinking, uh, hey, you should add more information about what you're, what you're writing about because a reader who doesn't have, uh, or who doesn't know the historical background might have a problem to understand some things. And, I, so I was thinking about these. So this is what I agree with group one, that there should be more information, more connections to historical background sometimes. And I was thinking about the specific periods and their years and what they might have meant for the following period. And I was thinking that there might be there might be like um, appropriate that there are moments when for example the first one i think it was 1779 there was it was when um, british influence became significantly stronger than the french one which had um, incredible meanings for india and then, for example, 19, 1947, the independence year, which might have had uh, influence for another uh, period. So this is what I was thinking about. And I think that these periods are quite appropriate. Um, yeah, that's, these are my points. Um, to comment on that, I think that Actually, the, the history is quite uh, well outlined quite well in this chapter too. So he really goes into detail, I think, uh, in the, the colonial history with regard to urban development in Bengaluru. Um, yeah, just, just to make that clear. But I think maybe uh, some, some other person has commented that what he, I think was um, missing uh, was uh, a rather uh, a clearer methodology of of this approach. 
and um, that's that's also maybe um, that that uh, is the point that we slightly criticized. But on the other hand, I think uh, it's it's also quite it's quite common for uh, this kind of work, writing an ethnography, that uh, you don't outline uh, a, a methodology that clearly as you would in in other scientific disciplines, maybe. Um, does it make sense? Or would you agree on this? Yeah. Writing style? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, I, 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 agree I agree as agree. well. Because I think he, he, he just like Eva said, he uh, just uh, assumes that people know this background or this uh, uh, general history uh, of India while, while writing. Um, which might not always be true for 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 readers uh, who who are not familiar with with what's going on. So uh, just this little background could have been uh, very informative about uh, the situation in India as a whole and then how it reflected on the city itself. Can I ask? Did it make you want to go find that information? Since it wasn't in the book, were you like, I better go? <laughs> um, Actually, yes, I did because, uh, but I did for myself. But um, the thing is that we have a similar uh, timeline or a very close timeline, especially with the colonization period and uh, the globalization periods with India. So they're just a, a, a few years apart, maybe four or six years apart. But yeah, I went to search on when did the uh, when did India get uh, independent? Really, uh, the year, the exact year. Because this this part I didn't know. I know that we were close, but not the exact year. So I searched for it. Yeah. Um, so Yasmin has um, posted something in the chat. Ah, okay. Useful uh, literature on Bengaluru. Thank you. I think there's a, it's a very interesting question about this methodology of periodization, because when you write something, um, it's, it creates a very clear and can create a very clear narrative when you have these different periods. Um, and then you need to sort of delineate these periods with specific years. Um, and so I've, I've used this occasionally. Um, and you need to try to find kind of what are some events or some kind of happening uh, that makes it natural to kind of depart from one phase over to another. Um, but of course, you always know that sort of in reality, there's these uh, these events that you that then use to say, okay, this year it's shifted from this to that, are kind of superficial in a way or, or symbolic, um, mm -hmm. while the actual shifts that we're trying to discuss are much sort of fun fundamental and deeper. In a way, so um, like the so texts that uh, Yasmin had us read on audacity of method yeah. and like doing a, a different kind of historiography, yeah. um, or the you know this Deleuze and like lines of flight idea. Yeah, but there's always a balance between sort of allowing for complexity uh, on one hand and then trying to create a clear narrative and this happened then and this happened that on the other. Um, so. Yeah, that's yeah, but I think also the author does make quite clear that this this history that he writes is somewhat contingent, and uh, just well his his personal approach on the topic and that there are other ways. So I think uh, that's that's actually totally fine for for the context of the book. But I can imagine that uh, readers, maybe from also from other disciplines, particularly face difficulties in in understanding why and how also other approaches of Kopa Kumar are um, based on methodology and how how he precisely proceeds in in I don't know conducting interviews and uh, evaluating his data and stuff. I was wondering, I had a, um, a question around, you mentioned that there seemed to be a lack of focus on the middle class and 
I'm not sure whether it's a reflection of which chapters we've read, but my impression was that the middle class was very present um, in what I've read. Um, but then I, I started wondering whether that is because of us having potentially different interpretations of who the middle class is in India. Um, so I guess my interpretation was that the middle class or is that the middle class are the, the drivers the, the people who are in, in vehicles um, in Bangalore. Um, so I just uh, thought it'd be interesting to hear what, who you think of as the middle class um, in this context. Yeah, so I think we think of the middle class in, in, in the same sense, sense, but maybe, yeah, because just like you said, because of the different chapters that we had to read, the ones that we have read, um, we did not notice very much uh, the, the participation of the, the, the middle class, of the drivers on this change. So how, uh, how do they uh, see it or how do they want to participate in it? Uh, this is the, the question that we were uh, asking rather than um, asking about whether they are present or not present or um, they are impacting the congestion or not. We were asking about their contribution to the solution of the congestion. So what will make them uh, participate in this, uh, in this approach, in this social equity approach? That's the idea we were having. Uh, maybe that's, this is a good point to clarify here. Did this answer your question? Yes, I think, but I do think it shows, yeah, that we, um, the chapters give quite different um, information in some sense, because in our chapter, the middle class definitely dominates quite a lot in terms of their role um, in shaping infrastructure and the discourses around it. So it's interesting, yeah. That would be interesting then. I'm, I'm waiting, I'm looking forward to, to hearing that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I also thought that actually the only other really um, content content or analysis, analysis chapter that we read was chapter six, so the, the, the one before the, the conclusion. And uh, this was, I think, um, maybe a bit of an approach to, yeah, to find to, to find contestation in, in this context of uh, mobility and congestion in Bengaluru. And I think uh, in, in this, the, the author may be focused more on um, yeah, the people that are marginalized in this discourse. Coming up with uh, some, some ideas of, um, what was it? mobilizing poor, poor and non-motorized infrastructures, performing acts of taking back the streets. Uh, that was sounded really much like uh, rather um, having a, an integrative and participatory focus on, on yeah, marginalized communities and um, people. It's, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say what we're going to say later, but, but we found actually um, the, the marginalized to be largely missing from from the conversation to some extent they were just present through their absence in a way in our key chapter so it's interesting how you yeah get certain perceptions of the book based on just having read you know not having read the whole the whole thing Is there anyone we haven't heard from yet that would like to comment before the next group presentation? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, I have a question. Sure. The floor is yours. Um, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. It just didn't seem like that. Okay. Um, I noticed in uh, your review that um, you wrote that the book could be useful both for um, activists and policy makers. And so I wondered if you think that the book is, could reach out to a wider audience and perhaps um, have an impact on policy making in Bangalore or other cities. Yeah.
Yeah, well, I think um, maybe on its compa compatibility, uh, compatibility, um, it's it's not so theory heavy. I think this book, and it's actually written quite uh, quite. I don't know how to say it, lightly, very easy to read in my opinion, and uh, I think therefore it it could actually find its way into policy making. Um, and also he, what we written in our review was that, uh, he does make quite a good job in formulating some, some clear, um, points to improve or to work on. And we thought that this could be, uh, yeah, starting points for a discussion really. And the hope was that uh, such a, I mean, obviously, uh, a study like this could not be easily reproduced in in urban planning just as a, for pragmatic reasons it's just way too way too complex to to come up with such a study for for daily work of planners but um i think it could still uh, inspire people the way how to read a city and an urban problem like this and that was that was our idea how such a book can influence policy making and really to see the problem, the, the very well-known issue of congestion from a different perspective. 